Whatever you say, say nothing when you talk about you know what. For if you know should hear you, you know what you'll get. They'll take you off to you know where and you wouldn't know how long. So for you know who's sake, don't let anyone hear you singing this song. This first person film, set in the 1950s, reminds us how Catholic grammar schools insisted on blind obedience. The system was a bully, thriving on parents and children being shamed into silence. The author's answer was resistance, mocking his tormentors as the twisted paper tigers they were. Starting as early as five years old, he fought against their unfairness and found standing up for yourself was its own reward. But those powers insisted on whatever you say, say nothing. Weber, let us go then, you and I, to a time of desperation, 1966. Even our government was desperate, desperate to draft 350,000 troops to replace that same number that LBJ had sent to Vietnam. They were so desperate, they drafted 17 asthmatic recruits along with me into my basic training company. They pleaded with the captain not to keep them in the tents with the dirt floors. Where the army cots were so low, their faces would be 12 inches from the dirt. They woke up wheezing and sent a sick call every day with varying degrees of their asthmatic symptoms. We all arrived September 26, 1966, by Christmas 66, all the asthmatics were given honorable medical discharges and a monthly disability check to cover what damage the army added to their already debilitating disease. This is a small example of the army's one-way communication with its troops. At least they finally communicated. At the same time, many young men were desperate seeking any way out of this ever-growing war that was escalated by a naval attack in the Bay of Tonkin that never happened, and it supported a family of corrupt Vietnamese dictators. I was one of those men, desperate enough to evade four inductions until the army uttered the magic words, five years in Leavenworth. I began to see entering the army as a plea bargain. Only desperation makes the army look like a better option. I was then sent to Fort Hamilton, Brooklyn, then to Fort Jackson, South Carolina, it's not the armpit of the world, but you can see it from there. It was hard to sympathize with these Southern drill instructors of F Company, but they did have to deal with an unusually high proportion of New Yorkers, 260 out of the 275 guys in my basic training company were recruits from the five boroughs. The sergeant's job was to scare you into blind obedience, in retrospect, I wondered how successful they were with these city kids after they found out the sergeants could trash talk forever, but they were not allowed to back any of that up with hitting you. A sergeant could lose his stripes for striking a lowly private. They could give you all the extra duty, crappy jobs like KP, but everything in the Army was a crappy boring, repetitive job. The recruit soon learned 
that the label chicken shit for discipline and petty pulling rank. Frequently, soldiers in country, in Nam, would challenge orders to shave while on the battlefield, saying, that's right, I'm not going to shave. What are you going to do? Draft me? My platoon seemed to have the lion's share of different folks. First in my recollection was Weber, a small, muscular, but pudgy young man with the stubborn, wisecracking will of a good-natured troublemaker. Weber had a cleft palate, and the sergeant just ignored it. For instance, at roll call, Weber couldn't muster much volume. And Sergeant Barkley, who called roll every morning, would relentlessly shout, I can't hear you! Every time, Weber shouted what was for him a shout, Hit Sergeant! I can't hear you! Over and over again, taunting Weber, who didn't let him bother him at all, which made the sergeant look like he just didn't get it. The weather in, in Columbia, South Carolina, home of Fort Jackson, was unlike anything I had ever seen, although I had traveled around the country. They said it was due to the sandy soil reflecting the sun into your face during the day and then giving up that heat as soon as the sun went down. A typical day was 32 degrees at 5 a.m. and 80 by lunch. When you're in basic training, you can't peel off layers until the sergeant says so, unless you're Weber. <laughs> he was always taking off something or unbuttoning something while asking, Oh, Sergeant Bosky, is this okay? I took off my hat because we, we are all too hot. Weber was always saying, we are all too hot. Like he was doing this for uh, the common good. Weber, put the damn hat on and give me 10. Weber would gladly jump down on the ground, do 10 half-ass Weber-style push-ups, jump up and say, thank you, Sergeant. Minutes later, Sergeant would tell everybody to strip off their field jacket liners and fold them on their equipment packs. Weber would smile to himself but not say a thing. Hell, he'd already thanked Sergeant Barkley, hadn't he? Going off base was, during basic training, was strictly verboten. I mean, it was, it was like you were in jail. But Weber was used to his hooch. He found a way to get off base and came back with a case of beer. He sold one six-pack, which paid for his case. He was no dumb drunk, and he drank the rest. And for some strange reason, he fell asleep in his footlocker all night while he was out scouting for this case of beer on Sunday afternoon. The rest of us slobs were spit polishing all our brass and leather in fear of our full company inspection by our colonel on Monday morning. So I said to Weber, what the hell are you going to do tomorrow? Uh, I'll be all right. Weber comes out that Monday morning, to platoon formation. And as usual, he's standing next to me. I look down at Weber's boots, which are scuffed beyond polishing and caked with fudge-thick mud. And I said, what? You forgot to even shine your boots, man? Sergeant Barkley's really going to be pissed. Really? Weber says in a mocking tone, bending over. He does something I, in the sand I can't quite make out until Weber stands up at attention. Then I can't believe my eyes. Weber has covered his boots with a pile of sand. You can't even see the shoe of the boot at all. Uh-oh, here comes Sergeant Barkley walking in between the rows of our platoon for inspection. Weber! You shit for brains, goon. Did your mother teach you how to clean your shoes? 
What have you done with your boots? Well, well, Dodger, my boots are bad, and I didn't want you to be upset. So I covered up my dirty boots. Of all the hair brain, I don't. Sergeant Barkley was about to throw a fit when he realized he was almost laughing, but he could not let on that he was about to crack up. So he turned to the next private, screwed down his concentration, bit his lip and said, Shoulder, look at that damn pocket. Did we give you buttons with your pockets, private? Yes, Sergeant. You're on report, boy. Schuler, a southern boy who went to military school, surely knew what to do on inspection day. He was securing that button when he was distracted by Weber's sand shenanigans and excavation and boot covering. And now he was getting put on report, which meant KP which might include grease trap duty, which was as foul a detail as they could throw at you in this boy's army. Just conjure the quality and quantity of grease in the U.S. Army. And rancid grease has a special bouquet all its own. You don't want me getting any more specific in this direction. Back to Weber. He actually got away with it. The sergeant forgot about going back to him and punishing him. And the colonel did not show up for our footlocker inspection. You can never tell if they will or they won't. Uh, it's their prerogative. It's an R-H-I-P. Rank has its privileges. I still can't believe it worked out. It was such a low percentage game. But that wasn't the point. Weber didn't give a shit. There was the key. He was trying the same game I was. Just getting into trouble in little doses. Nickel and diamond them to death. Until they figure you're just a waste of time and space and throw you out of this man's army. He also had the drop on them because of their ignorance of his cleft palate. They thought he was constantly breaking the rules because of his condition. As if it somehow lowered his IQ. Weber used that to get thrown out. He was dumb like a fox. Or Br'er Rabbit, pleading not to be thrown in the briar patch. Uh, my technique lasted 16 months, meaning I got out eight months early. Weber? He might have gotten out ahead of me the way he was going. I could still hear him shouting, well, as well as he could. Hit Dodgen! Weber. If you remember our Private Weber story, at the end of his story, Private Schuler was busted for the crime of an unbuttoned shirt pocket during a company inspection. An obvious threat to our national security. He was a good-natured sort, and this army experience was testing that good nature daily. He was one of the few Southerners in our company called F Troop, named after the TV show at the time, as we were officially F Company, and we had our share of misfits, like the show. With our quarter-inch tall army issue haircuts, he and I looked like twins, both six foot two with light blue eyes, hyperthyroid eyes. We both resembled the actor John Astin, who played Gomez Adams in the Adams family on TV. Well, this worked out really well for Schuler and I at the rifle range, because Schuler loved to shoot, and I hated guns. When we went down to the firing range, the way new recruits fired was always in pairs for safety. And being alphabetically close, we stood next to each other in every platoon formation. So it was easy to switch helmets. And what do you know? My marksmanship improved dramatically in just a week. I shot expert. 
I still have the medal to prove it. <laughs> we were switching helmets. Every time we fire, without a problem. But God help us if anybody asked us a question. Schuler was from the Georgia, South Carolina border. And, and I'm from New York. And it wasn't that his drawl was so bad. Well, it was. But he talked so slowly, you forgot the first part of his sentence by the time Schuler made his way to the ending. He was a good egg, though. And anyone who was up for putting one over on the U.S. Army had my undivided attention and full support. I always thought Sergeant Woodley was, he saw right through this little ruse, and he figured it was my loss if I didn't learn to shoot my weapon. He didn't know what I knew. I wasn't going anywhere. I would need a weapon for my everyday survival. I figured I'd be just as truthful with the army as they were with me. And these truths were like the weather forecast I once heard on an Irish TV show. All day long, variable. My lifesaver. When Johnny comes marching home again, hurrah, hurrah. We'll give him a hearty welcome then, hurrah, hurrah. The men will cheer and the boys will shout, the ladies, they will all turn out, and we'll all feel gay when Johnny comes marching home. This is a recruiting sergeant's version of this song, written in 1863, filled with optimism and upbeat, empty promises in exchange for a young man's life. Compare this with the original Irish version at the end of this story. My lifesaver. Danny O'Halloran was an unlikely lifesaver and just as unfit for military life as I was. My excuse was I was the black sheep of my family and a rebel in search of a cause. It was 1966 and the U.S. Army was desperate to draft any warm body no matter what their malady was. Hunchbacks, missing fingers, asthma, anti-military attitudes, etc. etc. They were all drafted along with me and Danny into my basic training company. The Army needed to replace 350,000 troops returning from a 13-month tour in Vietnam. Most would be leaving the Army forever with him. 60 days of their returning from now. We had both been sent to Fitzsimmons General Hospital, an army installation in Denver, on a permanent party basis, which is laughable, in that nothing in this man's army was permanent, especially for a bride of first class who was government grade A meat, ready to be shipped to any outpost. Danny and I were coping with uh, anti-military attitudes by self-medicating with cannabis. I had a small stash of the weed I brought back from New York and would part with small amounts to special clients like Danny for $20 an ounce. One more thing we had in common was getting fined $90 for insubordination, for cursing at an officer. When Danny got the news of $90 fine being taken out of his monthly paycheck, he owed me $20 out of a paycheck that was $94. I told him not to worry about it. They would subtract $30 a month for three months. I didn't mind waiting for someone who shared my disdain for pushy second lieutenants who thought you should just shut up and blindly obey no matter what kind of lies or just pain plain drivel was spewing from them. They were in fear of their alleged superiors. Why weren't we? Once again, 
we were proving to be unfit for military life. As Mark Twain said, always obey your superiors, if you have any. Days later, I walked into the barracks, as I did every week, to see if, and to see if my bed was made. I slept in my apartment downtown Denver, 20 miles off base, which I could afford due to the popularity of grass smoking in the Army. Everything seemed normal until some wise guy said, Sullivan, you're off to Nam. There's orders for you downstairs. His tone was a touch taunting, but I didn't bite, but I flew downstairs to the orderly room. There it was, the banality of evil, a plain eight and a half by 11 piece of paper sending me to hell on earth. They call it a levy, an order for a list of specific warm bodies by name, rank, and serial number to be sent from point A to point B. Pinned back perfectly at the corners with regulation push pins at regulation intervals. The normalcy of everyday bureaucratic order oiling the meat grinding war machine. What's it mean if I got a red line going through my name, I asked the company clerk. They gonna send me to, to the red Chinese army? Very funny, said the clerk. Go talk to O'Halloran, he's in personnel. O'Halloran? Great, just great. I'm getting sent to Nam by a guy who owes me 20 bucks. No favor goes unpunished. As I left the orderly room and round the corner, I ran into Gene Sample, another fellow traveler who I'll spend a few weeks in jail with later on in this saga. As we slapped each other's palms in a capital ca casual, complicated ritual, Gene said, how did you get out of going or not? What do you mean, Eugene? I'm on the levy, I said. He replied, no, man, the red line means your records are flagged. Like when I was in the brig, they flagged my records and personnel. You've got to be kidding me. Later, Gene. Thanks, man. I said as I walked away, wondering if this was possible. When I reached the glass doors of personnel, there he was at the front desk. Danny O'Halloran, at six foot one and 250 pounds, beaming like a Buddha in an army uniform. Hey, Saul, what's up? Are you kidding? We got to talk, man. Out in the hall. If it's about the 20 bucks, then forget about you owing me anything. We stepped out into the hallway. So how is it? Out of 30 guys on that list, I'm the only one with a red line through my name. Just the luck of the Irish. Yeah, right, the luck of the Irish. Who else has had an unsuccessful revolution for over 800 years? No, no, this, it's true. I mean, this time, you got friends in low places, you know, doing the dirty work, pushing file cabinets around and putting funny plastic tabs on people's personnel files. You remember... Those little one-inch plastic tabs on your loose-leaf binder in high school, you know, where you'd slide the subject into the empty tab? Yeah, that is a flag, and that's what's keeping you from going or not. The red line going through your name means Central Command sent an order, the levy, for these specific soldiers to go to now. But your friend, Private O'Halloran, Flag your records, vetoing their request for your warm body. A one-inch piece of plastic stuck on top of your personnel folder is what's keeping you from sunny Vietnam. I couldn't believe it. For anything this good to happen in the Army was impossible. Then it struck me, by its sheer size, the Army has to delegate some power and they didn't think they had to monitor this flagging. And Danny and I figured we deserved any break we could get, especially from a system with a mindset closer to Captain Bly than the world outside. I didn't want to break the spell, so I asked carefully. So, it's true, how long will it last? As long as you or I are on 
on this base, maybe longer. I still can't believe it. Now, about the 20 bucks that I still had, Danny, what are you, nuts? You saved my ass from going to NAMI, you're worried about paying me back a stinking 20 bucks? Well, no, Danny, don't even consider it. How am I going to repay you? Well, some tie stick would be nice, and you could say a novena. But seriously, I just love flagging those records. Pretty good, huh, Sully? We both extended both palm, hands up, palms up, and traded some skin. Thanks, Danny. You'd do the same in my shoes. Later on, I made a list of the things that got your records flagged for real. The Army's criteria, not Danny's. You would have to be, number one, a patient in the base hospital, two, a patient in the base psychiatric ward, three, a prisoner in the stockade, the base jail. I ended up spending months in all of the above before leaving that base and the Army, which is a lot easier to write about than to live through. You'd have thought Danny was the Nostradamus of the Army flagging my records before anybody knew they had to be flagged. When they finally threw me out of the Army, eight months early, they told me I was unfit for military life. That's what I told them when they drafted me 16 months before. Oh, here's the Irish version of the song I promised you. You haven't an arm, you haven't a leg, a room, a room. You haven't an arm, you haven't a leg, a room, a room. You haven't an arm, you haven't a leg. You're an armless, boneless, chickenless egg. You'll have to put out a bowl to beg. Oh, Johnny, I hardly knew you. Whatever you say, say nothing when you talk about you know what. For if you know should hear you, you know what you'll get. They'll take you off to you know where, and you wouldn't know how long. So for you know whose sake, don't let anyone hear you singing this song.